Hi. I can see a few uh, SOAS students in the audience who may well have heard a bit of what I'm about to talk about, because this is a sort of a favoured topic of mine. Um, I spent a lot of time in India and a lot of time here in, in England and there studying, um, studying basically the ascetic traditions, the yogi traditions of India. I spent a lot of time living with um, yogi traditions and what's become apparent to me over the, the years of study is that this sort of practice that we know as yoga today, which is seen as a sort of life-affirming, life-embracing, uh, uh, in fact, in the, over the last sort of 20, 30 years, it's almost in the way that uh, society has this uncanny, uncanny knack of doing so, it's been uh, turned into something that you can sort of fit into a very busy, positive, sort of world-affirming, uh, you know, uh, working lifestyle. Whereas, in fact, the way it's uh, been understood and practiced in India... Oh, I'm probably going to have to keep doing this. Oh, oh dear. Here we go. Yeah. That's, so, uh, that, that's to remind me not to talk too much and to keep <laughs> moving through the slides, because I've got lots of slides and I do have a tendency to talk too much. So, yeah, do remind me if I go too long. Um, yeah, so the, really where it came from in India, and, where it, and, and it still is practiced in that way, is in a very... Um, uh, kind of the opposite sense, perhaps, in some ways. So just a, a, a quick anecdote. I was in um, with Mark and Daniela, actually, in Gujarat, in, a, in Kutch, a temple called Dhinodar in, in March, and we met the, the, the abbot of this very ancient um, temple, this monastery of yogis that I've been dying to go to for 20 or 30 years. And I was delighted to discover that his sort of... his. Uh, so not his party tricks, probably the wrong word, but his, uh, what he's, he's best known for is once a year, and he's just finished, actually, he finished about three days ago. Once a year, he sits down for nine days and doesn't get up again. He doesn't eat, doesn't drink, doesn't go to the loo. He has a little thing that he leans on to sleep, and he's revered as a sort of you know, great yogi for this. So it's uh, somewhat different, I think, from how we understand or how many people do understand uh, yoga today around the world. Okay, so what I'm going to do, I'm now going to give you a kind of potted history, I haven't got very long, of uh, the ascetic traditions of yoga in India. I'll talk a little bit about how they've morphed over the last sort of few hundred years, and they did morph in India. We can't just sort of say, oh, the West has come along and turned uh, yoga into something completely different, because actually, through the work um, I've been doing with Mark and Daniela and Jason Birch, we've been yeah, we've, we've seen how actually through t there are texts from 16th, 17th, 18th century that show a, a, an increased um, emphasis on asana practice. So that's completely independent of any Western developments. And I think Mark will probably talk a bit more about that. Um, okay, so I've got a lot of slides to run through and I haven't got very long, so I'll be quick. So the, the ascetic traditions that, are, um, that we think are responsible for much of the sort of uh, development of things that we associate with, with yoga. Um, all, well, there was a, there was a kind of ve a, a great ferment in about the 5th or 6th century BC in this area in North India. So just near the border of Nepal, it's called Magadha. And in that region, lots of different uh, traditions of ascetics. Now, when I talk about ascetics, I mean people who sort of, you know, renounce normal society and life and who make uh, a religious, religious life, religious goals there their primary um, way of being. And these different groups um, were all kind of addressing these new uh, questions, these new metaphysical problems that had appeared. And these were uh, things that then became central to Hinduism and other uh, South Asian religions. So it's notions such as reincarnation, uh, karma, so the idea that your actions will affect your future birth and also what happens to you in this life. And then the associated idea that con con continuously being reborn uh, was a bad thing and you wanted to stop that, you want to get liberated, you want to get off this cycle of existence. So these different ascetic groups were addressing these questions and coming up with different answers to the problem. Now the most famous of them all, uh, oh, <laughs> sorry, there, is the Buddha. Um, now this, I think this is actually Kashmiri, this is probably 10th, 9th, 10th century, this ivory statue of the Buddha. Um, now, he's the most famous of the people that, that, that were in that region at the time. And he, he said to have tried... Well, it's interesting. There's, again, scholarship's moving quite fast in this area at the moment. So the, the classic narrative of the Buddha is that, he, that we get from the Pali Canon 
is that he tried these various extreme ascetic uh, practices. Some of them he didn't even try at all, actually. The more physical ones he mentions, he doesn't really try them. But he did sort of extreme breath control, fasting, and so forth, because he was moving in this milieu of all these different um, uh, types of, of, of people who were, who were you know, trying to get off the, the cycle of, of rebirth. So he did try uh, some of these things for a while. So this is a, a classic image. You'll find various other ones. I think the oldest go back to the sort of third or fourth century of the common era, but of the fasting Buddha. So you see he's you know, completely emaciated. Uh, I don't know if you can see from here, but his face is all, all drawn in. Now, the, the classic narrative is that he tried these things, but they didn't work, and he rejected them. He said all these, you know, the, in the Pali Canon, it says, you know, he, he fasted until his, his stomach felt like hot coals were burning inside, and uh, he held his breath for hours on end, and none of this actually calmed his mind at all. So eventually he gives them up, and he goes and sits under a tree for 40 days until he becomes enlightened. But actually, um, you know, one thing that's always bothered me about this is the existence of these kind of statues. Now, if that's the case, you know, if he rejected this, why do we get images of him you know, emaciated and fasting? Why would, we be, why would people be encouraged to worship him, him like that? And in fact, uh, texts, sort of recently discovered texts, particularly in China, so very early Chinese translations of, uh, of Buddhist texts from the second, third century, they miss out this bit of him rejecting the ascetic practices. So it's kind of seen as though it's a, a step on, on, on his path, and then, and then he becomes enlightened afterwards. But so, yeah, he... Ah, uh, oh, there's, sorry, there's another one. I, for, I should, have, should have run through my slides again. I put this together earlier today, and I haven't checked it all through. So that's a really classic one, again, from northwestern India. This... All of our sources are, uh, that uh, suggest that the uh, ascetic practices of the Buddha were, were valorized do come from northwest uh, India and China. Um, yes, yeah, so, and within the Pali Canon, so within some Buddhist texts, we do get these references to what people were getting up to round about. And this is a rather sort of um, almost a funny little chapter where he's, the, the Buddha has fallen in with, um, with some ascetics. They're traveling around in this, in this troop. And uh, they get to Varanasi, in fact, and there's a king, there's a king there that the, the leader of this troop wants to impress, so to get some patronage. And he says, what does he say? By once conciliating kings, a man may live happily all the years of his life. So now some of you do the swinging penance. This is vaguli vata. This literally means the, the bat penance. So it's hanging upside down from a tree. Some lie on thorn beds. Some endure the five fires. This is sitting surrounded by fire. Uh, some practice the mortification by squatting. It's not really clear exactly what that entails, although I, I'll show a picture of that in a minute. And this last one, Udukha, this is, so this is a Cal's 19th century translation. I think this means just uh, keeping oneself immersed in freezing cold water. Um, but this gives you some idea of the things that these people were trying in, 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 in this region, and most of which the Buddha uh, is said to have rejected. And another one is, uh, that he mentions is talking about... Um, people doing austerities, here's a stander up. So there's this notion of uh, people who never sit down. Um, and the reason I'm kind of bringing these up is also I'll show you some pictures, some you know, recent pictures from, from uh, my travels in India, which show you that all these things are still going on two and a half thousand years later, amongst the same people who also are renowned for practicing yoga. Um, this also, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm in danger of going over time, so I'll whiz through this, but... Also, we get information from uh, the histories of Alexander the Great. So he came across, I mean, again, like the Pali Canon, these texts are written quite some time after the events they describe. This is probably 300 years afterwards. But Alexander the Great also uh, met, encountered ascetics who would hold difficult physical postures. So here is it. Um, 15 men standing in different postures, sitting or lying down naked, who continued in these positions, uh, and so forth. I'm going to keep going. And then another story where um, one, of the, one of two ascetics that he met stood on one leg with a piece of wood three cubits in length raised in both hands. When one leg was fatigued, he changed to support the other. So these are the guys who are known as the, the gymnosophists, these naked philosophers who, uh, some of them joined Alexander's entourage and made it back to, uh, to, to Greece as well. Um, and prob probably influenced the development of asceticism in the West. Uh, and this is a, some of you may recognize this from the cover of uh, Mark and my book, Roots of Yoga. So this is a, from an uh, 18th century manuscript in the British Library, so illustrating this uh, hanging from a tree penance, which actually, I say they all 
continue to this day, but this is one that doesn't, I don't think. In fact, we get reports from the late 19th century saying it's dying out and it doesn't seem to be undertaken anymore. Um, I say, and another uh, religion from this time, the 5th century or so BC, that grew up is, is Jainism. Uh, this is a, a statue of one of the, the, the sort of greatest Tirthankara, the greatest Ford maker of Jainism, so Mahavira. Um, and they, they, are, they still to this day are renowned for great feats of asceticism. And this was also to, to combat this, uh, this notion of, of karma. They actually viewed karma as a physical thing, or they still do view karma as a physical substance that adheres to the soul. Uh, and so the ultimate way, you know, if you want to get enlightened, you've got to get rid of this karma because it's weighing down your soul. And so the first thing you need to do is do nothing. Otherwise, you accrue more karma. But also you need to do nothing in a sort of difficult, painful way because by doing these difficult, painful austerities, that burns up your past karma and gets rid of the stuff you already have. So this sort of classic thing for Jains, a bit like the yogi we met in, in Gujarat earlier this year, is a Jain monk who will just sit down and remain cross-legged and fast to death and believes he's going to get in line. That still goes on to this day. I mean, it's, it's rare, but um, cases do happen and they become quite celebrated in India. Uh, okay. And yes, this is a, uh, a piece of terracotta. There were 12 such, or 24, I can't remember if it's 2 times 12. Anyway, I think 12 such panels around a... Uh, a shrine in Kashmir from the 4th century. So this is depicting some sort of ascetic in a squatting posture. You saw that was mentioned earlier by the Buddha. Probably uh, what's called an Arjivaka. So this is another sect of, of ascetics from this from, that we know existed at the time of the Buddha, but th that one rather died out by about the 12th, 13th century in India. Um, okay, so um, from our earliest textual sources it's pretty clear, it's made clear that yoga and tapas, so tapas is the Indian word for asceticism. It literally comes from the root tap, which means to get hot. So the idea is that by, um, by performing these, these extreme or, uh, difficult uh, practices, you generate this heat uh, within your body, and this heat gets so, uh, so strong, so powerful, that you can then pers uh, pers use it for various ends, including persuading the gods, because the gods get worried you're going to get more powerful than them. So you can use it to persuade, you know, the gods will then give you, give you what you want. Um, and so this is from the Mahabharata, probably 2,000 years ago. And there you see the two, yoga and tapas, are intimately associated. So pursue siddhi, i.e. success or power, and yoga siddhi, so success in yoga by means of, of tapas. Um, and so... There's a somewhat ambivalent attitude, in fact, towards these, this practice of tapas in, in some of the early texts, particularly these um, extreme physical austerities. For example, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, uh, it's only very briefly mentioned, but he's sort of somewhat condemnatory of them. Uh, but they seem to become more accepted over the course of the first millennium. Now, this is, I think this, this, this illustrates both points. This is a a uh, relief in a place called Mahabalipuram, just south of Chennai, Madras, in southeast India, probably from about the 7th century. And if you see here, it's, it's called, known as Arjuna's Penance, although uh, art historians and all historians kind of disagree on exactly what it's uh, representing. But what we do see here is an ascetic in one of these postures. I think I've got to zoom in there. You can see him here. Hopefully the next one will... Oh, no. Sorry, you've got to go back there first. Anyway, he's got... Him here, so he's you know, standing on one leg, both arms in the air. This is a sort of classic posture of, of tapas, and you get these myths in the Puranas and the epics and so forth of ascetics holding these postures for years on end and then thereby getting what they want from the gods. Now, the, the sort of odd thing here is this, this uh, character, which appears to be a cat, and also doing the same sort of posture. And cats are kind of notoriously uh, duplicitous characters in in Sanskrit and Indic literature. So it's suggesting that perhaps, that, you know, that the ascetic is not doing, uh, you know, his motives may not be entirely uh, good for doing his practice. Um, and then this is from a similar period, probably 8th century. This is Parvati. So Parvati, Shiva's wife, the great god Shiva's wife, famously uh, tried to woo him by um, performing great austerities. So what, what the point I'm making here is that these these practices become sort of accepted by the mainstream, accepted by the orthodox Brahmanical traditions in India over this period. Um, 
And then, yeah, I'm going to... How am I doing for time, by the way? Because I've got quite... Is there, have you got it? Maybe I should get my phone out. And, or just tell me how long I've got. Half an hour left. Half an hour left. OK, fine. All right. I could, I'll slow down a bit, so I'm probably talking a bit fast. <laughs> um, OK, so this is... I'm just going to... Uh, yeah, showing you the continuity again. This is a, a favourite image of mine from... It's from probably around 1635. It's... Uh, from an album uh, 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 called, uh, they're known as Muraka, these uh, Persian albums of, of miniatures, and it depicts a sadhu camp. Um, it's currently in the museum in St. Petersburg. And so you see, uh, the reason I like it is because it's very similar to the camps you get at the Kumbh Mela festivals and so forth in India to this day, and probably a lot nicer because you wouldn't have the blaring loudspeakers going all the time. Uh, or you do have a few musicians knocking about somewhere. Where are they? Up here, I think, over here. Anyway, there's this. This fella here, who's doing this, this double Urdhva Bahu, so he's holding both his arms in the air, um, which is, again, long attested and still goes on to this day. I think I've got some... Ah, oh, yes, this is, this is another image. You get another one doing the same thing here, both his arms in the air. But this is quite interesting. We get, I mean, people often ask me, and I'll probably preempt a question here, but people often ask me about um, the position of women in these traditions. I mean, we've seen Parvati doing uh, tapas, but within the yoga text, we really get very little in the way of mentions of women actually practicing yoga. We do get sort of fleeting, oblique references uh, which tell us that there were women practicing yoga, uh, but they, they don't really give us much in the way of detail, if anything. But these, there's quite a few images like this, these Mughal miniatures, which show uh, women ascetics doing this. So the, the swing is like I mentioned the the, the yogi sitting down in Gujarat who had something to lean on when he slept. This, this indicates that she never sits down, so she'll be leaning on that to, to sleep at night. Okay, and we get quite a few of these, but I know of no other sources that, that uh, give us any information about women doing these, these sort of things. Um, and again, this is, a sort of, this is a 18th century illustration to a manuscript of the Ramayana, so the story of Ram in the British Library. And this shows a sort of, you know, it's, it's actually the same person, Vishwamitra. This is a common way of showing sort of different episodes in one person's life that you'll find in, in uh, Indian illustrations. So he's performing various different forms of tapas. Now, I mean, some of them, I suppose he's sitting in the lotus position. Uh, this one, I think, possibly he's meant to be levitating. We're not sure, but in a similar-ish um, uh, set, set of images also from the British Library, if I remember rightly, 18th, early 19th century colonial from South India. You'll see again this sort of crossover. You've got some similar postures. Here you've got a handstand, though. You've got this being, you know, sitting in freezing cold water. But here, I, the, the hand up here is meant to indicate that he's doing pranayama, breath control. And breath control is often, one of the results of mastering <coughs> uh, breath control is often said to be leaving the ground, not necessarily not necessarily being able to fly, but kind of bhumi tyaga, it's called. So it's kind of leaving the ground, rising up above the ground. So this is sort of illustrates the crossover between yoga and uh, asceticism. Um, and here, yeah, I think I've got a few, a few recent-ish pictures. That's from the Kumbh Mela in 1995 that I attended. So these, and these, uh, so the sort of, you know, when these Kumbh Melas come around and they, they beam the pictures of these naked Naga sadhus, uh, you know, they look like crazy wild men and you wonder what they've got to do. But they are what they've got to do with what I'm talking about, apart from the fact that they, they do these uh, extreme austerities. But it's these, their same lineages are also the ones responsible for the production of lots of the, the texts on, on yoga that we then refer to, you know, for yoga practice and, and the history of yoga. And it's among these people that we find uh, the practice of some of the more extreme and more difficult uh, uh, techniques of yoga. And I think I've got a bit to say about that. So he's, this guy, Amar Bharati, he's, he's had one arm up. And that's, yeah, something, the, nowadays no one puts two arms in the air for some reason. They've gone a bit lightweight and they only put one up. But he's had one in the air for about 40 years. And, and he's always put at the front of the main camp of the, of the Naga Akaras. You know, because as the Buddha himself, you know, kind of implies in that, that statement that, they know that this is also a draw. You know, on, 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 from one perspective, it's a performance. You know, it attracts devotees, attracts pilgrims to come and see them and then give them money and uh, you know, create a, a buzz around them. Um, 
And so, yes, again, this is uh, the sitting surrounded by fire was mentioned earlier on. Um, and this uh, one particular sect, that the one I actually I'm associated with, is famous for doing this. Um, and again, they put on a big display of it at these festivals. And then some of them, after doing this, this practice of dunitap, they will do a few yoga postures. Okay, now, and again, just to keep illustrating this point of the interplay between yoga and tapas, uh, this is a, a, a chap called Puran Puri, and in fact, there's an extract that I'm going to show you now in, in our book, Roots of Yoga, because I, I sort of stumbled upon this by accident four or five years ago now. And an absolutely fascinating report on him uh, in a, in a uh, magazine called the European Magazine from 1810, and he when he was, you know, must have been a young, sort of early teenager, wanted, to, he'd become an ascetic, but he wanted to undertake one of these kind of extreme practices. And he lists them. This is his life story, was taken down by, by a, 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 a British uh, colonial in, must have been probably the very end of the, or maybe the beginning of the 19th century. So he, he lived, you know, he lived mainly through the second half of the 18th century. And he lists these 18 practices. Now, among them are things like, you know, at the top, Tadishwari or Kadishwari, it's now normally known as standing, standing up all the time. Uh, this other one, Akash Muni, always looking up at the sky. Uh, but then we also have things like number eight, Chaurasi Asan. Okay, so adopting, that, which means 84 postures. And it's a famous, you know, if, if an ascetic is renowned as a yogi today, often uh, his peers or he will tell you, and I say he because I'm afraid my experience of, of Women, and maybe Daniela will talk more about this, but I'm not, even, I'm not sure if any women would do Chaurasi Asan. Actually, maybe Ram Priyadas. Ram Priyadas, yeah. Um, but anyway, so, you know, as one, these are all uh, sort of associated, bundled together. So, uh, you know, he was told he could choose from one of these 18 things. So the other one is the Chaurasi Asan, 84 different postures in sitting, such as continuing several hours with the feet on the neck or under the arms, after which the members are returned to their natural positions. And there's also Kapali, which is a headstand. Uh, what else do we have? Chaurangi Asan, number 14, another difficult posture. Urdhvabahu, arms in the air, which is the one he chose. Uh, Panchagni, being surrounded by five fires, and so forth. Okay. Uh, and actually, it was very interesting discovering this. It was about the same time that... Um, it was just before there was a big show on yoga at the Smithsonian, uh, the Sackler Gallery in Washington, D.C., and you won't be able to see here, but there were various things in, in miniatures that we, look, we were looking at um, that we couldn't work out what the hell they were doing, and actually the, this, this uh, report from Puran Puri explained a few of them, such as this one. There was a few pictures of someone like this, and we know what on earth's going on there? And now it seems clear that these, these ascetics, these yogis, are doing the Akash Muni, so they're always looking at the sky. It looks extremely uncomfortable, doesn't it? To, have your neck back like that all the time. Now, also, Puran Puri, um, so these, these ascetics who undertake these, um, you know, these really extreme practices, but, but they don't sort of then just sit down cowed by their, these austerities, you know, kind of begging on the side of the road, not doing much. Um, well, some of them do, but plenty of them don't. And they kind of see, you know, it kind of comes with a great kind of almost not arrogance, but a great power and, and pride. And he decided, he, he, he didn't just sit down, he actually was the most incredible traveler. And this report that I found in the magazine gives the full details of his whole, and I, I'm just going to whiz through this, you can see where he went. He ended up, uh, the furthest he got to was Moscow. He wanted to go to Moscow, he wanted to go, he wanted to, go to, to England, because the Brits were in India checking out his country, so he thought, well, I want to go and check out yours. But he got to uh, Moscow, and the crowds were so great that he, he turned back. He was causing too much of a scene, but he didn't go straight home. He, uh, okay, I'm, I'm aware I'm going to... I, be, I better keep going. How, how long have I got? So I should have a watch for this. Um, okay, good. What, including questions, or...? Um, no. Okay, all right, I can slow up a bit then. Um, Right, now, so that just what I've, so what I've been explaining, uh, I hope, is that, um, you know, this intimate connection between extreme ascetic practice 
and uh, yoga up to this day, you know, from, two and, from our earliest records, you know, two and a half thousand years ago up to this day. But as I mentioned at the beginning, at some point a kind of slightly different um, approach to these, particularly these physical practices, does, does appear. We get no, none, nothing other than the extreme, and I'm thinking about this as I'm writing a paper on it at the moment, so I'm, we get no mention of uh, postures other than these really quite difficult austerities such as standing on one leg or holding arms up for long periods uh, until about a thousand years ago and there's a text uh, from Gujarat from this region actually just west of here a text called the Yoga Shastra of Hemachandra and again I include a, or we, we include a translation from that in Roots of Yoga and he's it's the first text really to list you know a lots of, of, of postures asanas which aren't just seated positions for meditation. So it's an important point. Up to, up to around this period, asana in yoga texts always just refers to a seated posture for meditation. Um, I'm not quite sure how to refer to the other postures, I say non-seated postures or complex postures, but we start seeing things that are, you know, much, uh, well, that you can't hold indefinitely for a start. I think that's a pretty key, key point. So things like headstands or it's around this, this time, in fact, that the, the peacock, the Mayur Asana, in fact, the earliest attested um, description of a non-seated or complex posture is of Mayur Asana, probably from about the 10th century. Um, now, and the other, another, yeah, another point I'd like to make is we know, so this is a recent discovery that Daniela and I made, and Mark then uh, came, came with us again earlier this year. We discovered the earliest depictions of of asanas, by, and they're earliest by about 300 years, but this is still only 1230, okay? So there's first mention in text is a re, you know, maybe 100 or 200 years earlier than that, and these are the first uh, depictions in stone. Um, what, what we can infer from these depictions and from some of the texts from Hemachandra is that there was a lot more going on than what we know from texts. You know, a lot of the postures shown here that I'm about to show you, and also in some other places, we have no descriptions of them in texts anywhere. Um, so yeah, yeah, take a lot of what I'm saying with a pinch of salt. You know, we're just seeing um, tiny kind of through through little pinholes in back into the into the history of yoga. But yeah, this was um, this is a really exciting discovery. We went here to look at something quite different, and just because it happened to be en route, it was it's only been written about in one obscure Hindi article from 1953, okay, and I, and I, 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 I got, read this article and there was a mention of these Nath yogis, that's a different sort of uh, obsession of mine, um, so I said, right, we've got to go and have a look, and so if you see, you see the gate here, so there's three registers of, of sculptures inside, uh, and along the bottom we see these uh, 12 Nath yogis or siddhas of this um, ancient tantric yoga tradition. So that's what we went to look at. Uh, I'll keep going. So this is one of Matsyendra, who's the sort of first human guru of this Nath yogi order. You can always recognize him because he's always depicted with a fish. Um, and then Gauraksha, who's perhaps more famous nowadays. There's lots of Hatha yoga texts attributed to Gauraksha. I mean, there are asanas named after both of them and so forth. So we went, you know, in order to see this. Uh, and above the siddhas are these yoginis. So it's very much the, um, the, uh, the carvings, the statues on this gate are very, very much from Shaiva tantric traditions, okay? The worship of Shiva was central to them. Uh, on the top, so this one of these eight yoginis are depicted. And then there's these eight uh, Bhairavas with consorts. So Bhairavas like the terrifying form of Shiva. So this is all wonderful, amazing. I mean, I, I showed these, at the, we had a meeting at the VNA last week to talk about a possible show that they might be doing, and I showed them, showed this to the curator, and they were all like, my God, this is amazing. You know, they want to recreate it, because it's, I mean, this is, India's just still so full of treasures. No one knows about this. No, the, everyone's, it's, the gate is still, you know, it's a thoroughfare, and people are driving forth, and there's, there's a policeman's uh, sort of, post at the bottom, and he was actually interested in local history, but he had absolutely no idea what's on this gate. Um, and heaven knows how many more such treasures there are round about. Anyway, that was wonderful, but then, as we were looking around, Daniela noticed up here, this uh, yogi, you can't quite see, but I think I might have a better image of him, uh, this yogi with his feet behind his head, and then as we looked in all these nooks and crannies, we discovered that there are all these other uh, yogis in various yoga postures, so I'll, 
run through them quickly. That's a you know, inverted sort of lotus position kind of thing. Headstand. I'm not going to give names to them all because lots of them, like I say, lots of them are not taught in text. We have no other, uh, no precedents for them, no textual sources either. And they're clearly yogis. We can tell from what they're wearing, their accoutrement, that they're meant to be yogis. Okay, now that, so that's from about 12.30. Um, the, bef before that, the earliest uh, such images that we knew about were from Vijayanagar or Hampi. Um, and so, as, we as well as the kind of classic ascetic images, so you see standing on one leg, arms in the air, uh, as, as I showed before. But then you also get, so this is Matsyendra again, uh, sitting on the fish. And I, I'm sure the yoga aficionados among you will know of the Matsyendrasana or the Ardha Matsyendrasana. And we're wondering whether, in fact, the reason for the pose is because of how artists depict him when he's sitting on his fish, because he has to have a bit of a twist in order to do that. And there's about 50 or 60 uh, such carvings of him at Humpy. Uh, then you get images like this. Now, these, this, this thing's known in some texts as the don, uh, a sonta or a danda, and it's the, a short club that yogis carry. And again, we know that this is a yogi because of his, his hair and his accoutrement, but we have no um, references to any of these postures in any text or anything like that. And this one crops up a lot. Again, I, actually, I wonder, I wanted to, maybe I'll have a look afterwards, but in Puran Puri's description of the 18 uh, tapasyas, he has this chaurangi asana, which look, it could be a bit like that. But this posture crops up a lot, sometimes actually balanced on, on the hand as well, raised off the ground. Yeah, you see, there it is again, sort of. And again, you can see, because he's got the mala the, for, for uh, repeating mantras, for counting mantras that are being repeated. We know this is... Because other, in other similar situations in temples and so forth, uh, you know, there are earlier depictions, but it's pretty likely, it seems clear to me, that they're acrobats rather than yogis. And again, of course, there's a fine line of this sort of notion of performance. When does, a, when does yoga just become uh, gymnastics and so forth? Uh, but here, I think we can be sure that there's a religious aspect to it. And then finally, again, from the same period, we went here. Uh, this is last year, Daniela and I hear Matsyendra cropping up again this time. He's in always in slightly different poses. Here he's got this yoga pata, this yoga belt, uh, holding his legs in place, sitting on his fish. And this, again, is from around 1540, probably. You can see some curious postures going on there. Again, not really, even though it's around this time that um, complex, non-seated postures start appearing in text, we don't get these ones described, or not all of them, some of them. This one, obviously, is a classic kukutasana. Again, inverted lotus. Okay, and then these are images that were... Uh, more of them were shown, uh, they're from a manuscript in the library, in the Chester Beatty Library, which is in Dublin. The manuscript was illustrated and probably copied in 1602, and these are the earliest known images of uh, yoga, po early, earliest known paintings of yoga postures. Um, and I'll just flick through those. This, this is a Sufi, so they're illustrating a Persian text on yoga. So there's clearly, you know, we know... We know from at least the 14th, 13th, 14th century, there was great, great interest from, uh, from Sufi traditions in yoga practice. And this was a, a text that was uh, written, claims to be a translation. It's more of a sort of reframing compilation of Sanskrit yoga texts then put into, uh, or Sanskrit teachings then reworked into Persian. But this text apparently is still current, still being used by Sufis in Egypt and in the Middle East. They don't really tell you about that because it's sort of, you know, that's not something they want to shout about, but the, apparently these, these traditions are still current. And the focus is more on meditative techniques, but they have all these really curious, complex, um, special postures for meditation, like you can see here. And then, interestingly, we discovered a, a, manuscript, a Sanskrit manuscript um, from a similar period, which also, also teaches the same, the same practices, but they're not in any published uh, text yet, or any published translations, anyway.
Okay, so yeah, this is the Meyer Arsenal. Again, this is the, I think I showed an image earlier, didn't I, of the Tapkar Arsenal. So around, from, a, from, a sort of, from the 17th century onwards, we start getting texts which um, describe 84 uh, different postures. 84 is usually the number. Some of them have more than that. Uh, and then we also start getting illustrated manuscripts. So there's this beautiful one in the British Library. I don't think you're allowed to go and see it. I think, you have, well, you, I think maybe you can have a special arrangement to go and, go and see it, but we've got scans of all of them now, so we can share them. Um, I hope you can see at the back there, uh, at a headstand. Now, this is interesting, Kapali Arsan. Okay, so that's also what Puran Puri, he calls the headstand Kapali Arsan. So it's from around the same period, late 18th century. But then the, the Jain scholar that I was talking about, Hema Chandra, who wrote his text at the end of the 12th century, he also says that another name for the headstand is Kapali Asana. And then we have a 600-year gap in which that name, as far as I'm aware, doesn't crop up in any text, even when headstands are talked about. So again, this is just to illustrate that there's a, a living oral tradition that's going on that really we can only get tiny little glimpses of. Um, Shivalinga Asana. Mahamudra Asana, and this is, and what goes here, Mahamudra, and again I could, you know, a, a, another lecture, another time, but um, in the earliest text to teach physical yoga practice is a text called the Amrita Siddhi, which I've been working on probably 11th century. It teaches these three techniques for manipulating the vital energies in the body, so Bindu, Prana, and, and so forth, and thereby controlling the mind. And then uh, in subsequent texts, those practices are joined with other techniques, you know, esoteric techniques for controlling the, the vital energies, which are collectively known as mudras. But then later on, these mudras get reworked as asanas. So among the 84 asanas in this text, you get the maha mudra asana. And the same with um, the corpse pose, shavasana. When that's first taught in a text, it's not an asana, it's a special, it's called a sanketa of laya yoga, and it's a special esoteric technique for uh, achieving samadhi. And then the same verses get reworked in a in, in the Hatha Pradipika, 15th century, and it, gets, it, it starts being, it's called an asana for the first time. Okay, so corpse pose is, is, you know, it's more than just a relaxation posture. When it's first taught, it really is, it's kind of the secret teaching of Shiva, coupled with some other bizarre secret teachings, but it's said to bring the yogi to uh, samadhi very quickly. Okay, now I think I'm going to wrap up. Um, so this is just to show again, this is just a, a sequence of, of, of pictures that I like, like showing, just to show that, okay, so these, these traditions of um, physical practice are still very much current among uh, ascetic traditions. I mean, there are some variations between sects, and in fact, as far as I thought, this sect didn't really practice um, uh, uh, Ex, you know, a complex asana practice, until I met this uh, yogi, yogi Baba Anupnath in 2011, I met him for the first time at this monastery in the Himalayas, a place called Jwala Mukhi, a very ancient sort of uh, tantric monastery, and I was introduced to him as Yogi Baba, and I was okay, you know, I'd heard at this point that, um, well, I was developing a theory at the time that his sect, so this Nart tantric lineage, didn't really do asanas, and then he proceeded to do this amazing sequence of postures in front of me, and I thought, oh God, all right, we might have to I'm going to have to rewrite that one. And uh, asked him at the end, and I said, so, you know, where did you, uh, it's a long story, but I'm cutting it very short. Where did you, um, you know, where did you learn these postures from? And he said, ah, oh, they came to me direct from Guru Goraknath, who's like the, you know, the 12th century founder of the, tech, of, of the sect, as I showed you earlier, these pictures of Goraksha. And he's also pretty handy with a, with a smartphone. So I think that he was, you know, he had his other sources for these practices. Um, he, well, he's, he's, he's gone, on, gone on to greater things. Anyway, I could talk about him for ages. But, so if you're looking at this, you know, this is a classic kind of extreme ascetic posture. I think me mentioned by um, Puran Puri as well, turning the, I'm sure some of you great yogis here can do it. I know Mark can do it. So it's not, it looks, looks like it's very bad for your knees. Um, <laughs> but he also, you know, he also does, did this posture. And this kind of completely bamboozled me. But again, it's something that you don't find in any yoga text. We have no descriptions of it, even up into the 20th century. And I think it was Mark who pointed out to me that, in fact, it's, it's that. Okay, so this is a famous yoga practitioner called Kino McGregor. So I think he was, you know, he's been learning his yoga, basically, through, 
uh, through the internet quite a lot of it. Um, so this is, a, this is sort of this is one of the things I use actually to tr to convince people of the urgency and importance of, of research into the history of yoga because it's all changing very very fast. You know, as is everything, as uh, information flows so much faster around the world, things are things are change, changing very fast. But um, so I think that's my last slide. Oh no, ah oh, no, sorry. I've got, uh, <laughs> no, I normally put that as my last slide. I forgot. Yeah, just I got a few, have I got five minutes, three minutes? Four minutes, that's perfect. Um, yes, just to go back to this point about yoga being, you know, to reiterate, yoga being about uh, extreme ascetic practice. And in fact, it's very closely associated with death. Um, but in in uh, some of the more esoteric uh, yoga texts, the ones that you may not find translations of, um, well, actually, I've translated one of them, but um, there's, there's various methods for either for deceiving death, for cheating death. So there's... You'll find yoga texts, a lot of yoga texts are full of um, uh, descriptions of signs of impending death. You know, weird things like, you know, if you see a crow co cross from north to south, it means you're going to die in three months' time or something. And so the yogi really wants to know when death is, a, a, is going to arrive, and then he can prepare himself for it. And uh, he can basically, if he goes into samadhi, uh, death will arrive, death will come to get him and go, ah, oh, nothing to see here, nothing to do, he's dead already, and go away, and then he can come back to life. Or, on another, or he can actually decide to die, to leave the body. There's a thing called utkranti, normally translated as, as yogic suicide, uh, whereby the yogi can project the life force through the, the top of the head and then either put it into someone else or go to permanent liberation, you know, uh, join it with the, with, with the cosmos, effectively. Um, but yeah, this is a kind of ironic, you know, this is, a, this is taking the mickey out. It's a, a list of various religious practitioners that are having the mickey taken out of them in a in a prose sort of prose poem, if it doesn't, if that's not a uh, oxymoron from the sixth century, and it's you know the, the kind of stereotype of yoga is that yogis are obsessed with uh, throwing themselves onto a spike and killing themselves. Uh, and again, often in, in texts from that period in particular or the first millennium, you know people will use it says they use by means of yoga cast off their bodies. So yoga is is really closely associated with death, also closely associated with extreme ascetic practice. Um, but we see a shift uh, in this, over the last, particularly over the last thousand years. So as I mentioned earlier, tapas is closely associated with yoga. Tapas is generally said to be done, you know, one of the best ways, here it says, this is a sort of ninth century text, says that the best way of tapas, doing tapas is fasting, drying out the body. Um, but then in the Hatha Pradipika, which is a sort of classic text on physical yoga from the 15th century, it says you should stop. You shouldn't do things which harm the body, um, such as bathing in the early morning and fasting. So we see this kind of shift away as as yoga becomes something more about cultivating the body, a more positive thing. And as it's being taught to the general public, I mean, this the general public is probably not quite the right word, but the uh, this you know one of the puzzles that we we have working on these texts is why were they written? You know, when we know that for 1,500 years people were practicing yoga without using these texts. And the answer seems to be that a thousand years ago, uh, the ascetics who were, who were uh, using these techniques decided or were encouraged, were persuaded perhaps by royal patrons uh, or patrons of some sort to uh, adapt their teachings to a, a wider audience. Um, so we see that um, in a eight, probably 18th century text that I expect Mark's going to talk about shortly, Tapas, the notion of tapas is completely reworked to just following one's own dharma, one's own sort of birth-given duty. You know, there's no notion of doing anything bad to your body. You're just, uh, you know, you're being a good, good Hindu, effectively. So that's the same as the message of the, of the Bhagavad Gita. Um, you know, this is a text that's otherwise full of asanas and strange mudras and so forth, but it still says that tapas uh, is, is nothing to do with drying out the body and so forth. It's just, just following your, your duty. And then... I think this is the last slide. Um, and that, this kind of new attitude is summed up in an earlier text called the Shiva Sangata, another text which I've translated, has been published, uh, where this text takes verses which do come from earlier ascetic traditions, but it frames it completely differently and says that these practices are now all for householders, so regular people like you and me saying, living in a house filled with children and a wife and so forth, internally abandoning attachment and then seeing the mark of success on the path of yoga, 
the householder has fun. He can have fun. Crede it means he can kind of indulge, you can indulge yourself uh, if you've mastered my teaching. This is Shiva uh, explaining it. So the, we get this spin that, you know, you can... So I suppose, actually, I'm thinking about it now, but I guess, guess it's a sort of forerunner of what's really accelerated over the last sort of 20, 30 years, this notion of getting a little bit of yoga into your life as a way of, um, of making the rest of it better. Um, on which note... I will stop. <laughs> Perfect. That's a CD. Um, so okay, got time for some questions, and then Mark's gonna. I mean, yeah, is that the way we want to do it? Yeah, you happy with that? Okay. So, if anyone's got any far away. Oh yeah, Daboy. It's a pretty grotty little town just east of Baroda, Badodra. So uh, probably, do you know where Ahmedabad is in Gujarat? So it's about three quarters of the way between Bombay and Ahmedabad, just off the, the highway. Yeah. Not the, yeah, not stay in Baroda if you go and visit. Yeah, I don't know. That's what, so I suggested that it's... I, I, I have a feeling that it, it starts with... So there's this idea of Raja Yoga, which gets interpreted in various different ways, OK? But the one way that it's clearly understood... I mean, when it's explained in scholarly yoga texts, Raja Yoga is quite... You know, this, so this modern notion... I don't know if you're all aware of this, but Mark's written at length about this. Um, you know, this idea of a, a contrast between Raja Yoga as meditation and Hatha Yoga as physical practice, that's not found before the 20th century. Um, Raja Yoga, in, in lots of Hatha texts, is kind of just simply equated with Samadhi, but it also has the sense of yoga for kings. Okay, so what seems to be going on is that these, the texts, particularly the ones that are teaching Raja Yoga, they're teaching a yoga method that may be used by kings. And we find, we find a similar notion, actually, in earlier tantric traditions, where th there are special royal initiations where the king can get all the benefits of being a, a tantric practitioner without actually having to do the practices. Okay. So the, the Raja Yoga notion, it's like a watered-down version, or watered-down is perhaps not the right... Because some, some of the ways it's taught... So Jason Birch, our colleague, or his... Um, his PhD was a text called the, on, on a text called the Amanaska Yoga, which is about Raja Yoga. But that, that teaches a kind of a not arduous, not ascetic, simple meditative uh, method of achieving yoga without any physical practices or anything like that. Uh, on the other hand, you, know, you also... So I've, I've, I've finally gone to press an article of mine on, on a technique called Vajroli Mudra, which I've been working on for years, which is this uh, uh, sexual yoga technique which, if you master it, supposedly you can then, you know, the king is able to satisfy his many wives in his harem. And still, and then there, you know, there's, a, there's an obsession running through lots of yoga texts of, of uh, preserving semen, semen being seen as the life force of, of, in the body, so that if... Um, should I turn that off? If... Uh, so obviously that power off... Yes, press the button. Oh, God. Uh, um, uh, yeah, kind of. You know, it's, it's so then saying basically by mastering this t this technique, you can have the the benefits of being a celibate yogi while still in indulging your senses like a king. So there's that that perhaps is one of the reasons for the composition of, of some some of the texts. Um, but again, you know, it's all uh, hypothetical. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, generally, up to about, up to, so pretty much up to the Hatha Pradipika, or the, uh, sometimes known as the Hatha Yoga Pradipika, 15th century, which is attributed to a, you know, p possibly identifiable human being, um, but a scholar. And after that, the texts are generally, you know, pundits, sans, you know, Brahmins who know Sanskrit, and they're kind of more scholarly. Before that, they're less so, uh, and they, but they're generally attributed either to gods or to kind of, 
deified, these siddhas, these great, great yogis. Um, but yeah, I think you, you're, um, you're, you're definitely onto something there because it seems that the texts were probably not composed. And often it's clear because some of the texts teach practices that are, A, clearly completely impossible. You know, there's some that say you can draw water up through your bottom and piss it out after that. I mean, you know, I think you're, you're going to hospital before you can do that. And, and so what, what the point of that is, I don't know. Um, there are... Uh, and there are others that teach the practices wrong, you know, and then you'll get a, you'll get a, you know, a later, a later author will come along and say, but, you know, and quote, quote it and say, that guy had no idea what he was talking about. So it seems to be that I think, again, you know, maybe these, these kings, this is a, again, a kind of, this, this is my best current hypothesis, but these kings or patrons of some sort uh, were impressed by these yogis, wanted to get some of their techniques and also perhaps... Uh, perhaps thought they needed some kind of legitimization, you know, where are your texts? These Brahmins have got their texts that they're always working with, where are your texts? And so then perhaps they would have commissioned uh, a scholar, a Brahmin, to sit with the yogis and write, write a text, or, you know, and then he's slightly clutching at straws, you know, perhaps a bit like us as anthropologists or whatever, you know, trying to understand what these yogis are doing, and they'll tell us half of it, but not all of it, you know. So, yeah, but I think you're absolutely right. I don't think the texts were written by the, certainly not by the, Practitioners par excellence, anyway. No, I think we can be pretty sure that Patanjali uh, existed. Yeah, I mean, he's a, he was a great scholar. I can, you know, that's 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 clear. There are myths, you know, a lot of myths and legends have grown up around him. Uh, there's a professor in the states called Gudrun Buneman who I think she's just she's just written a book on this, isn't she? About to publish a book. Uh, about the sort of cult of Patanjali and how he becomes deified and identified with Ananta or Sheshnag, this kind of serpent uh, deity, uh, by about the 11th or 12th century. But of the, the real Patanjali, there's not much we can say. He also gets um, identified with uh, Patanjali, who wrote a very influential Sanskrit grammar, but that Patanjali clearly lived much earlier. Um, there's the kind of consensus on the dating of Patanjali now is... Uh, f around the 4th century CE, um, possibly living in the northwest, but again, I don't think that's, that's very clear. Uh, but he was a great scholar. I mean, he was a serious Sanskritist. I mean, so in, this, this, in our book, Roots of Yoga, I think we, we translate passages from more than 100 texts, and Patanjali is the toughest by a long way. You know, he's the one I have to, you know, we have to keep going back to and going back to. Um, you know, brilliant, brilliant scholar, but... Who knows if he was a brilliant practitioner as well, you know, whether he was... It's, that's, a, that's a moot point, I think. Um, you mentioned the Kamehameha, um, the Shrana movement. Yeah, I didn't use that word. Well done. I think yeah, I, I, I should have... Oh, did I? Oh, I should have done, anyway. And, um, so there, there were a lot of petty-dumped worldviews that made up that asceticism. Um, so is it fair to then approach yoga and Well, I think amongst the, 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 the people that we know were practicing it, yes, it seems to be closely associated up to a point. And again, actually, another, yeah, a point I didn't make is that I, I know of no references to people other than ascetics practicing yoga prior to the 20th century. You know, nothing. You know, travelers' reports. I mean, maybe it's because they're not so interesting and not so exciting as the sort of extreme practitioners, but there's not one record that I know of, of someone who's not, you know, a full-time member of some ascetic lineage doing yoga. Well, he's an ascetic. Okay. Yeah, he, you know, he, when I say ascetic, I mean some, sorry, yeah, there's kind of fuzzy, fuzzy terminology, but when I say ascetic, I mean someone who's renounced normal existence. It almost always involves renouncing family life, definitely not having a job, you know, not working for, for your subsistence, living off arms, that kind of thing. So the, the yogis that we know about, um, Apart from actually, well, I suppose it slightly gets complicated by the old tantric yogi. So Marco Polo, I think, reports on some tantric yo yogis living with consorts. Um, but again, they're kind of full-time professionals. So we don't, we don't get any records of people just doing a little bit of yoga um, to enrich their lives. Although it is prescribed in some texts, perhaps, for some Brahmins. You know, they're instructed to do pranayama before certain uh, rituals and so forth. But kind of... Asana practice, absolutely not. We have no, no record of that. In your opinion, how old is yoga? 
difficult question. Well, the oldest text that we have that we have any passages from in Roots of Yoga is the Atharva Veda. So that's the latest of the four Vedas dated to around 1000 BC. Um, you know, people will trot out the image of, of the, the seal from Indus Valley, with a, um, some sort of horned possibly figure sitting in a, in a difficult cross-legged position and say, oh look, yoga, but then we have nothing for 1500 years, you know, so you know, I, I think we need more, and it, for me anything, in fact even the Atharva Veda, what well, the Atharva Veda reference is just about some weird sort of esoteric uh, parallels or correspondences between the breaths and uh, the, the flow of time, which we do find echoed in later yoga texts. So that suggests some sort of continuity, uh, but it's nothing more than that. There's no description of meditation or... So the kind of general consensus is that it's this period that I was talking about, about 500 BC, that a lot of these techniques developed. Um, they may have been around beforehand, but we have no evidence of it. One more. If one, if anyone, if there's one more, we can time for one more. I'd like to know more about the religions. Uh, what's the name? It's, it's French or Catholic? Nowadays, Catholic. Well, nowadays, I mean, it's a combination. I think there are sort of push, and they, I think anthropologists, probably maybe Daniela can talk more about this, but more, but do you, you push and pull factors and that sort of thing. Maybe you're going to talk about it next week. Well, either you get, you know, so my guru, for example, he hated his family life. You know, he had his, his mother died and he got a step, he was only 10 at the time, so he didn't like his stepmother and he ran away from home and he met his guru on the river and, and then at the same time, you know, the, it's, a fa it's kind of a very uh, well-known motif in India of, you know, the Babas, the yogis will come along and steal your children because they're also looking out for good candidates, you know. The, it's, you want to initiate um, uh, your, your, your disciples when they're young because then they become, they become better yogis. Converse, you know, it, as opposed to this idea we have of renunciation being something you do at the end of your life, actually the, the, the yogis who are valued most are the ones who start as children. Um, so there's that factor. There's also the attraction, you know, you go to the Kumbh Mela and you see these big gurus and they're, you know, they're extremely charismatic uh, they're having a great time, you know, so there's, some, there's a certain amount of draw there as well. Um, and then, obviously, there's plenty of stories of uh, yogis who just have a kind of spiritual leaning from, from a very early age, and, and that's all they ever want to do, and they constantly badger their, their parents. Eventually, their parents have to give in and, and let them go. So, you know, it's, it's all kinds of, of different reasons. But I don't think, and again, so Daniela's more of the ethnographer than I am, but I think it's doing fine, isn't it, that world in India at the moment? I don't see any, there's plenty of, plenty of sadhus around, plenty of people joining these traditions and it's not, not going away anytime fast. Yeah, 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 they get rich, a lot of them get very rich and also you can, you know, a lot of them own property as well, they're like, they can be like abbots owning a monastery or something and you pass that on, so there's that, you know, there's, there's worldly factors in there as well. There's no, well, that's, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a good... I would like to become a priest and, like, even teen. It's, it's another kind of job, but you are not connected with the social responsibility, the family and the things that you... So sometimes they escape from what they really said because they don't want to go to school or because they don't like the family or because the mother is too, too strict with them. And I met this Baba who instead met a yogi Thank you.